was 16 years old, my, um, my 19 year old brother, uh, who was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder when he entered uh, the LA County Jail, was uh, brutalized, almost beaten to death by the Sheriff's Department. Um, he was beaten so badly, he blacked out when he awoke, he was in a pool of his own blood. Uh, they handcuffed him to the bedpost, and for up to two weeks, they starved him. Uh, they left him without a blanket or a cot to sleep on. Um, and, then they, and then they hid him from us. Um, we called every day uh, asking about uh, where he was and what was happening. And the sheriff's department just gave us the run around. Um, my mother uh, had no one to call, literally. The only people she could call were the people that were brutalizing the son. And so uh, that was my beginning of uh, being enraged. I grew up with a lot, a significant amount of healthy anger, I think. Um, grew up with a lot of anger, and I, I needed to know where to take it. Um, I joined, uh, you all call it campaigning. Um, we call it organizing. Uh, I joined organization uh, when I was 17 years old. And I remember the first thing I said to the organization uh, was, do you fight police? That's what I wanted to do. I always knew I wanted to fight the police. They were the, they were the, the, sing, they were the single most um, sort of terrorist organization in and, and my uh, life. And I wanted to know how to fight them. I wanted to know how to keep them, hold them accountable. Um, so I started doing uh, work when I was 17 years old against the police. And uh, from there, uh, did different sorts of things, ran campaigns that focused on trying to get them out of high schools, ran campaigns that focused on de decriminalizing um, young people's lives. And then two years ago, uh, I started, uh, three, two and a half years ago, now, I started an organization called Dignity and Power Now that focuses on uh, deaths inside the LA County jails, as well as uh, brutalization inside the LA County jails. Um, so I sort of did a full circle back to my own my own history, my brother's um, my brother's uh, condition. Uh, from there, um, after George Zimmerman's acquittal, Trayvon Martin's murder. How many remember Trayvon Martin, the young boy in uh, Florida and, and America who was murdered by a vigilante? Um, his murderer was acquitted. And on social media is where the birth of Black Lives Matter, the hashtag that has really taken uh, across the globe and has gone viral. Uh, that hashtag was birthed on social media. Myself, Alicia Garza, and Opal Sometti, uh, two other black women, uh, put this hashtag out as a form of, um, uh, as a mantra, as a call to action, um, and as a reminder um, that black lives matter, even when uh, society, even when people, even when vigilantes, even when police get away with murdering us, we will still stand and say our lives do matter. Um, from there, the hashtag literally uh, overnight went to the streets. Uh, we shut down Beverly Hills Boulevard. Uh, we shut down Hollywood Boulevard. We shut down a major highway in our, in our neighborhood. And we used the hashtag both online, but it was also important that we use the hashtag on the streets, that we use it as a form of protest. Um, that uh, we use it as a form of disruption. Um, that mainstream media had to look at our posters, right? They had to, they had to see the Black Lives Matter signs. Um, fast forward, uh, Renisha McBride is murdered. Uh, she was a young woman uh, in Detroit. Uh, she uh, went, to, uh, she was a suburb right outside of Detroit. She was driving, she got in a car accident, she got out of her car, she looked, she looked for help. She knocked on someone's door, they shot her through the door, they didn't even open the door, blew off her face. Um, Renisha McBride, a young black woman. Many times we say the names of black men. Uh, this movement, black, black Lives, is actually talking about all lives, all black lives, and the impact um, that uh, racism, that terrorism, and that I say terrorism, I'm talking about the police, has on, on our lives. Um, and so Renisha McBride um, was uh, murdered. And uh, we, once again, the hashtag revives itself. Black Lives Matter. And we're talking about Black Lives Matter, all Black Lives. Um, and then Mike Brown's murdered. And when Mike Brown's murdered, I say uh, the Mike Brown, Mike Brown Rebellion. Uh, and there's always a history of, of rebellion, right? Wherever there's a free, oppressed people, there are going to be rebellions. Um, this was just, this is our generation's rebellion. Um, Mike Brown is murdered. And he's left in the street for four and a half hours. Um, and he's left on display for four and a half hours. And the community in Ferguson is uh, growing increasingly angry, disturbed. Um, and the, the, the community across the country 
we're watching it live on our Twitter feed, right? People are tweeting it. And we're watching as they keep him on the ground. They don't call for medical attention. When they finally uh, lift him up off the ground, they put him in an unmarked vehicle. And uh, the community goes out to protest that evening. They hold a vigil that evening, and the police show up and riot here. That was the police's response to black people grief, riot here. Um, and then we, across the country, start to show up to Ferguson. So it's important for people to know our, the way in which we stood in solidarity across the country is we literally took ourselves to St. Louis, to Ferguson. And at first, it was just surrounding communities. But then it became surrounding the state of Chicago, New York. Um, and then uh, myself and a good friend of mine, Darnell Moore, co-organized a ride uh, called the Black Lives Matter Ride, um, where over 600 black people from across the country, including Toronto, Canada, drove into St. Louis, Missouri, to uplift the conversation and say, Ferguson is not an aberration. This is a national epidemic. Every 28 hours, a black person is murdered by a law enforcement by a vigilante or a security guard. Those are the numbers in the US. And so that was important for us. Uh, it was important that we, that we didn't allow the media to write the script, that we didn't allow the media to say, oh, this only happens in small little towns where white racists live, right? We were like, actually, white racists live across the entire country. Actually, right, racists are right inside the White House. Actually, there are entire um, uh, laws and institutions that have developed um, out of uh, the subjugation of black bodies, right? And so this now becomes, uh, that ride really sort of uh, catapulted uh, the national conversation around law enforcement violence. And then from there, uh, many of us go back into our own neighborhoods and shut shit down. Um, one of the biggest thing I, I learned about Ferguson is it does not take 2,000 people to shut shit down. Uh, five people can shut a freeway down we did it in Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> Uh, 10 people can shut a Walmart down, we did it in Ferguson. Um, and, but more what it's about is being determined, being determined to get your voice heard, being determined um, uh, to let media and press know, um, and your community know that we're not going anywhere. And so we've been shutting shit down since August 9th. Um, we are still shutting shit down. Uh, and in Los Angeles, for example, we occupied the LAPD, uh, Los Angeles Police Headquarters for 18 days. Uh, over the murder of Ezell Ford, a young black man who was murdered just two days after Mike Brown was murdered. In a very similar manner, on the street, he was walking home to policemen who knew um, Ezell Ford, and Ezell Ford had a schizophrenia. And um, they shot him in the back. They said he was, that he was reaching for the gun. They always say they're reaching for the gun. I say, how many times, I don't understand if every single black person is reaching for the gun, how come they haven't killed a police officer yet? Is it really a house in <laughs> So for us, with the Isel Ford case in LA, it was important that, that we, we push this conversation. Look at here, right in Los Angeles, um, 2,000 miles away from Ferguson, someone is murdered two days later. And so now, as you, you've seen, I'm pretty sure you've seen your social media, um, there's probably the, the question around um, a lot of people ask, especially the media, well, it seems to be happening a lot more. I said, no, it's not happening a lot more. You're just now actually uh, broadcasting it, right? You're making it a story now. We, we've been known this has been happening in our community. Um, and I think for me, uh, the biggest reason uh, why I'm here, and uh, here in the UK, is to make the connection. I think you said it beautifully, right? The national epidemic is actually an international epidemic. And the people who are most disproportionately impacted are black people. And we have to call for Black Lives Matter. Uh, we have to call, uh, talk about this specificity of uh, black devalue. Um, and we have to make these international connections. We have to say that um, we're not going to allow this to happen in America, and you all are not going to allow it to ha happen in the UK. So I'm grateful for the families that I've met. I'm grateful for this opportunity, and I'm hoping to come back here more to build um, the bridges, and I'm hoping to bring folks from the UK to the United States. Um, and solidarity um, is a gift. And um, I just feel, I feel really excited to be building these connections and excited about um, ending state violence.